Hello and welcome to The Print. I am Moshumi Das Gupta and today we have with us former election commissioner Mr. Ashok Lavasa. Mr. Lavasa was in the election commission between January 2018 to August 2020. He resigned two years before his term ended and joined the Asian Development Bank as vice president, private sector operations. Mr. Lavasa is going to talk to us about the election commission of India and its role in the ongoing elections. Welcome to the print, sir. Thank you very much. So the election commission of India during this election season has been making headlines, uh, if I may say, for all the wrong reasons, from issuing notices to political parties instead of individuals who have violated the model code of conduct to taking an adversarial stand in the Supreme Court on declaring authentic voter turnout uh, data. So, as someone who has worked in the election commission, who has seen its working from close quarters, how do you see this development? Do you think that these amount to undermining the constitutional authority of the election commission? Thank you very much. See, first of all, what I want to say is that the election commission has a very formidable task in conducting the elections of a country as big as India with more than a one million polling stations with 98 crore voters and such a huge logistical challenge. So I think it uh, does a commendable job. Uh, it has been doing a commendable job for the last so many years in which elections have been conducted smoothly. And uh, I, I think uh, the way in which elections have been conducted in India, it is something which has been acknowledged by everybody. So what happens during the elections, as you know, in fact, I would like to tell you that a lot of people think that election commission is active only during the time of the poll. Mm -hmm. But actually this constitutional body is active throughout the intervening period of five years between the two polls. But what it does during that period, nobody takes notice of. Uh, so in terms of managing an electoral role, updating it, cleaning it, that's one big part in which uh, election commission tries to ensure that all the voters who are eligible, they find their name in the electoral roll. So I think that's a big challenge and that's a huge work which election commission does. The second thing is about the conduct of polls. And even in the conduct of polls, there is the big part of the elections which is managed through an, a standard operating procedure. Uh, whether it is identification of the places where polling stations will be installed, uh, the planning of the elections, the deployment of people, moving of security forces. So all this huge gigantic exercises, they're able to conduct very efficiently. And what I call this is uh, the non-discretionary part of the EC's operations. But the two issues that you've raised, one on the model code of conduct and the other on the data about which there is a controversy. Now, somehow the focus during the period of polling is always on the model code, the way it is enforced, because quite rightly, during this period, the atmosphere is so charged and it is such a contesting time. So everybody is looking at everyone else and trying to point fingers and trying to invoke the authority of the election commission. So to that extent, it becomes a very challenging task. On the data side, I feel that uh, it is the election commission is duty bound mm -hmm. and it is also capable of sharing with the people whatever data is available to it. So I think that this is a needless controversy which has been created. Uh, it should have been easily possible for people to get this data. In the past, this has been done. In fact, uh, if you recall, earlier there used to be a practice that after the close of poll on any polling day, about an hour or two hours after the close of poll, election commission would hold a press conference and invite questions from the media, share whatever happened, important events during the day, share the approximate number of votes cast in terms of percentages and clearly tell the people through the media 
that there would still be people waiting in the queue and this is an approximate number which will be released later. Mm. And subsequently, in two days or three days, that data would come out. So what it shows, uh, Moshvi, is that there is a system which is in place through which this data is captured and through which this data can be made public. The fact that election commissions are able to do this for the second phase in four days or the third phase in uh, less than four days shows that the data is there. So why it took 11 days in the first phase, I frankly don't know. It surprises me why it should have taken that much time. That is one. The second thing is that, you know, if you know, know the percentage, how do you calculate the percentage without the basic numbers? Mm -hmm. So I think that number uh, is available and it should be compiled and presented to the people. As uh, I have said it, that, you know, it is like organizing a match, a cricket match, in which you say that, yes, the match is being played, we are maintaining the score in the score in the scorer's room, but we will not display it on the board. So how do you, it will obviously increase the anxiety mm -hmm. of the people if they don't know what is happening. But sir, what could be the probable reason for the ECI to take this stand? For instance, in the Supreme Court, the ECI has argued that, you know, indiscriminate disclosure of the voter turnout numbers under Form 17 will cause chaos during polling. So, do you think that the ECI's stand is just? No, I don't understand. First of all, it is not indiscriminate disclosure. Because, as you know, on the, when the poll closes, the presiding officers are legally responsible for filling Form 17C, which contains the data on the number of people who have cast their vote in that polling station on that day. So, and this data, a copy of this, not this data, a copy of this form, signed copy is given to the candidate and the polling, the agent. polling agents of the candidate, which means that this data is already there with the people. So, when a physical copy is available with lakhs of polling agents, mm. even they can manipulate that, the physical copy. Mm. So, I don't understand how uh, this apprehension of somebody morphing the data, mm. uh, if it is put on the website, I don't understand that. In any case, I am of the view that there is no need to upload Form 17C. Mm. I think this demand has arisen because the compiled data was not available. Therefore, suddenly people started saying that, oh, no, no, please put the Form 17C itself on the website. Mm -hmm. Because putting the Form 17C on the website will leave people equally confused and in the dark. Because who's going to compile all the Form 17s? Mm -hmm. So I feel that, yes, when this data is available with the commission, the day after the poll, there is a scrutiny of the documents. Mm. So let me explain the system to you. This Form 17C is put in an envelope at the end of the poll. A copy of that is given to the agents of the polling party. And that F Form 17C envelope, along with the EVMs, is put in a sealed room, mm. strong room, to be opened at the time of counting so you can cross-check that this is the Form 17C which was signed that day. And if you have the copy of the Form 17, please cross-check that we are counting that many number of votes which were cast in this voting machine. Mm -hmm. The day after the poll, there is a scrutiny done by the returning officer and the observer. Mm -hmm. And after doing the scrutiny, they send a report to the election commission. The purpose of that scrutiny is A, to recommend to the election commission whether there was any vitiation of the polling process and whether any re-poll is required. But it is also to authenticate the data of polling and see if there are any discrepancies and then tell the commission. And that is the reason why, whereas the initial press conference after the day of the poll would give an approximate number, after two days or three days, the election yeah. commission would come out with a more authentic number. So I think it would, should have been possible. It is still possible. 
that this data is released because it will, you see, the more transparent you are, the less will be the doubt that people will have. It was a completely avoidable. In fact, that brings me to another issue that, you know, these are all issues which election commission can easily resolve itself. There is no need for any intermediation by anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, there should not be the need for people to go to uh, the highest judiciary uh, to get redressal of these kind of things. You enter into a dialogue with the stakeholders who are raising this issue and present your limitations to them, hear out their genuine grievance if they have, and try and address those grievances. I'm sure people of this country are reasonable. They do understand how a system works. And I think the more open you are, the more confidence people have in, uh, in your credibility. The ECI uh, issuing notices to the BJP party president and the Congress party president for MCC violation made by Prime Minister Modi in BJP's case and Rahul Gandhi in case of Congress uh, has again raised eyebrows. Uh, do you think that this is something which is unprecedented? And uh, I mean, what is the procedure like? I mean, do ECI issue notices to political parties or individuals who have made the violation? See, the procedure so far has always been that whenever there is a complaint which election commission receives about any alleged violation. So first election commission tries to get a report from the field to substantiate and verify whether this incident which is alleged has actually taken place. So that is number one. Having got this report from the field, it satisfies itself whether there is a prima facie case made out for a violation and then it issues a notice to the alleged violator and after receiving a response in order to provide natural justice, it decides, takes a decision on whatever restriction it wants to impose or whatever uh, warning or punishment so-called that it wants to ad administer. So that is the process. And by its very nature, Moshmi, the model code of conduct is a consensual document mm -hmm. to which the political parties have agreed and which is administered by the election commission only for this short duration of campaigning or after the poll is announced. And therefore, all decisions have to be quick. If you don't take a quick decision, then it loses its purpose. So therefore, this is the procedure. And quite rightly, it is unprecedented for the ECI to give a notice to a party. There have been instances in the past where the election commission would write to the political parties, seek their cooperation, or generally uh, request them that this is the expectation of the commission. So I think that is okay. But giving a notice to the party for the alleged violation of any individual, this is unprecedented. But even if it is unprecedented, I think it is something which is in the right direction. Because other than the individual, I think it is the political parties also who should take the responsibility of an acceptable conduct of all their campaigners and their candidates. So I would feel that going forward, and I have said it in the past, that actually the model code of conduct has been an evolving document. And it should continue to be. Times have changed. The environment in which elections are conducted, that has changed. Technology has changed. There are so many ways in which people are campaigning and it is difficult for the election commission to capture everything in the existing model code. So I think there has to be a thorough review of the model code. And in As in need to uh, strengthen the model code of conduct? Precisely. Not only strengthen the model code of conduct, but also to my mind, incorporate in the model code two things. A, that classify the violations into categories and almost say, as you do in law, that if this is the violation, then this could be the consequence. That is one. 
Number two, I think it is important for the model code to contain the procedure which will be followed in dealing with complaints so that that procedure is out there in the open. Election Commission itself is bound to a time-bound disposal. And number three, Moshim, I think just as we were discussing in the case of the data, the electoral and voting data, similarly, all complaints about model code of conduct violation, they should be put on the website. The disposal should be open for public viewing and let the people decide whether the election commission has taken the right decision or wrong. That is a different thing. Because always some people will be satisfied, some people may not be satisfied. But at least nobody can say that you are delaying or you are not telling us what you have done. So therefore, the procedure should be time bound and all material, all data should be put on the website so that people know that this is what it is. And the fourth element of the reform, I think, is to make parties liable also. But sir, in this case, I mean, you don't actually expect the Congress President, Mr. Malikarjun Kharge, to pull up Rahul Gandhi for violating MCC or uh, the BJP President to pull up uh, the Prime Minister for violating the model code of conduct. No, I think we are talking of two different things. I am not saying that if you make the party responsible, it should be at the cost of making, absolving the individual. Mm -hmm. The individual has the primary responsibility. I am saying in addition to that, okay. in addition to that, after all, it is the parties which decide who the star campaigners yeah. are. And at the when the elections were announced this time, uh, you remember the chief election commissioner had actually said quite explicitly that he had circulated the model code of conduct mm -hmm. to all the parties and he had specifically said that this has been brought to the notice with a request that it should be brought to the notice of all their campaigners mm -hmm. so that they adhere to the model code. Clearly, the election commission, as in the past, seeks the support of the political parties in maintaining this public decorum. So therefore, whether what punishment or what action the party takes with respect to the star campaigners is their internal outlook. I am sure there is no political party which will say that I am allowing my campaigner to commit a violation of the model code. So if the EC has determined that there is a violation, and if it has requested the party to take action, then I think that is it. The party doesn't have to make any separate determination. And let's let's look at, let's do a dissection of what has happened. If the election commission were not prima facie satisfied that there is a violation, there was no need to issue this notice or this letter to the parties. So the fact that they have requested the party president or ask the party presidents to uh, issue a notice or a warning or caution or whatever mm. does indicate that they do feel that there is a violation. Mm. Otherwise, the, where was the need? They could have just said that we don't find any violation. And this is not even in the nature of seeking a general cooperation mm -hmm. because that letter had been issued in the beginning itself. Right. So I see that there is a difference and I see that this change of involving the parties or making them responsible is a change for the good. I think it should be formalized through a proper uh, review of the model code of conduct. Okay. I mean, you don't think that it is, uh, I mean, it kind of decisions like this kind of put a question mark on the ECI's uh, independence. It does put a question mark because you are not taking any action against the individual. Mm. Because as I said, the primary complaint is against the individual. So election commission has to take action against the individual also. Mm. What I am saying is, in addition, it has decided to involve the parties, which is a good step. Okay. Uh, so the new law uh, which has come to appoint the chief election commissioners and the other uh, election commissioners 
uh, where they have excluded the Chief Justice of India from the selection committee. So that has also come under a lot of criticism from the opposition. Uh, the opposition has been saying that, uh, you know, in uh, basically uh, the uh, government has uh, not understood the spirit of the Supreme Court judgment, which was that ECI should be an independent body and it should not uh, be an arm of the government. So how do you view it? So let's look at it uh, slightly differently. In the past, the way in which election commissioners have been appointed was a system which has been going on for uh, a long time, ever since the constitution came into being. And there have been election commissioners and chief election commissioners who have been applauded for the good work that they have done. So I don't know whether the procedure or the system of appointment itself affects the performance of the election commission. That is one part. But Supreme Court, in its wisdom, they decided that parliament should enact a law. So far, for 70 odd years, the enabling provision existed in the constitution, but a law had not been enacted. But the procedure was going on. The system was going on as such. Supreme Court decided that there should be a law. And till the government made a law, they made an interim arrangement in which the Chief Justice was a part of the selection committee. Now, the Parliament in its wisdom takes a decision that this is going to be the composition of the committee in which the Chief Justice of India is excluded. I don't think you can say that this is good or this is bad because ultimately the same committee can end up taking a decision, selecting a person who might not perform well. Right? Mm -hmm. Chief Justice has been a member of several committees. Mm -hmm. So, are we saying that all the selections made by this committee, uh, they meet general public approval? Or their performance is something which universally satisfies everyone? So, I think we need to understand that the process and the outcome, they are not necessarily linked. That is one part. Having said that, I think it adds to the credibility of the system if there is an outside representation in this election. Right? So if the Chief Justice of India or anyone else not connected with the government mm -hmm. would have been made a part of the selection committee, that would have enhanced the, the purity of the process as it were. And people would have felt that, okay, it is not simply that uh, the government is deciding and they have the majority. Some outside people are also there. And if they are also convinced, they take, uh, they support the government's view, that's fine. But that will be a decision. In fact, uh, I know that there was a suggestion that even in this composition, mm -hmm. it should be by consensus and it should not be by majority. This was also a suggestion. I don't know whether that is workable, but clearly... I think it would have been a good, healthy practice if there would have been an outside representative in the selection committee. That brings in a degree of independence also. Sir, how do you see this ECI's decision to hold a, you know, seven phase long election spread over two months? I mean, it's unfair not only to the voters, but to the candidates also who are campaigning in this seat. Well, uh, the heat, of course, is something which election commission cannot uh, control. But seven phase long election. Yes. So, you know, earlier the election commissions were not so stretched out. In fact, the first election, which took place in 1951, it had 62 phases. 62 phases. <laughs> so, that election started sometimes in uh, October hmm. and it finished in February, right? But I think they were pleasant months, so people didn't mind. Uh, and also because we were, that was the first election and uh, the logistics and so many things were still being worked out. Also the fact that uh, it was decided that elections in uh, the upper reaches of Himachal Pradesh should be held earlier so as to not get into a snowfall situation. But anyway, but then when you see later, 
you also have an instance in the second election where the entire election process in the entire country was completed in less than three weeks, right? So things have changed. The magnitude has gone up. But certainly, there is a case for a very serious review by the Election Commission in consultation with so many other people who are involved in the planning and support of conduct of elections to see whether we can curtail this duration. And I am sure that it should be possible with modern technology, with uh, transportation facilities available, with the system of deployment, which also needs to be reviewed. And uh, do you need so much security? Do you need to deploy so much manpower at a polling station? I think all those things require a very serious systematic review. And uh, I, uh, I personally feel that it should be possible to do the elections in three or four phases. It is doable. I think it is doable. I am not sure uh, how it can be done, but that will require a detailed exercise. Uh, even today, if you see, there are maybe 20, 21 states where elections are done in one phase, mm -hmm. right? So that leaves only a few states. And with, I think, a lot of planning and uh, operational research, uh, one can devise a way in which this entire period can be curtailed. What do you think about one nation, one election? I mean, should a country like India have only one election and not, you know, you have elections around the year. I mean, either some state or the other is going to pose or, I mean, after five years, you have the Lok Sabha elections. Well, now we have the recommendations of the committee, uh, which I'm sure the next government will consider. Uh, I have written about it in the past, before the committee deliberated on it. And uh, I personally feel that more than the administrative aspect of conduct of elections, uh, what we need to preserve is the spirit of democracy. And I don't see why if an election is held in Nagaland, why should it disturb anybody in uh, Rajasthan, or if an election is held in Himachal Pradesh, why should it bother anybody in the state of Karnataka? I mean, this we are a federation, and the states have their own autonomy. Uh, the election cycle of five years contains within it the system, our legislative system of functioning. It contains within it the right to move no confidence, mm. the right to withdraw support from a government. So what happens in case uh, a government falls in between? So are you looking at a phase of two years where there is no elected government? Or are you looking at a short election which will elect a government only for a shorter period? So that would mean that just for the sake of aligning all the elections, we are willing to conduct more elections and curtail the scope of this. So I, I feel that elections raise local issues which are more important for people of that particular area. So people have a right to uh, make up their mind in a national election in a different way, in a local election in a different way. A lot of people feel that uh, if you have simultaneous elections, then the local issues get a subsidiary treatment. So I think all these are material issues, but in terms of uh, it being able to achieve uh, an efficient management exercise, if that is our objective, then I'm sure one nation, one election can achieve that result. Although uh, I am still to look at the data on how much money it will save. Because even if you spend, for example, in 2019, according to the official statistics, 9,000 crores were spent. It's less than 100 rupees per, candidate, per voter in five years. It's not a big expenditure if you conduct elections separately. And if you combine the elections, how much money is going to be saved? I, I have not seen that data. Mm -hmm. Sir, in the run-up to this uh, Lok Sabha elections, 
we have seen all these investigative agencies like ED, you know, going after politicians, raiding politicians. Uh, two of the sitting chief ministers have been arrested in ongoing cases. So do you think this kind of, uh, you know, action, uh, you know, it kind of denies a level playing field for the opposition? See, that is another uh, issue which has come up uh, for discussion during these elections. It has been highlighted. The action taken by the enforcement agencies. Uh, as things obtain today, uh, especially if you look at the model code of conduct, which gives this uh, overriding authority to the election commission to regulate the conduct of various uh, agencies. The law enforcement agencies, except those which are directly involved in the conduct of elections, they don't come under the purview of the election commission. And I don't think that it's good for the system to give election commission the responsibility of conducting the affairs or overseeing the affairs of all these law enforcement agencies uh, during it will have too much burden on itself mm -hmm. their main task is to conduct the elections freely fairly provide a level playing field but having said that i think article 324 gives overriding authority to the election commission considering that it is the sole authority to control and supervise and provide superintendence over elections. No one else is responsible for that. So if election commission does actually feel that a certain thing is coming in the way of free and fair conduct of elections, I think it is very much within its right. And I would dare say they are responsible for intervening and ensuring that no injustice of this kind is done to anyone. So in February this year, uh, the Supreme Court had stuck down the electoral bond scheme, calling it unconstitutional. How do you view it? Well, the jury is already out. The scheme has been declared unconstitutional. Uh, again, I have written extensively about the scheme. I think uh, the more uh, opaque schemes we get rid of, the more opaque arrangements that are out of the way, the better it is for uh, the people and the better it is for the system for the country uh, there is no reason why uh, anybody would want to fund a political party and not declare, declare their identity not declare their identity in fact uh, in this particular instance the state is supporting non-disclosure, was supporting non-disclosure by giving tax incentives. Because those who made donations, they also got tax breaks on the donations that they made. So I don't think there was any other arrangement or there still is any other arrangement in the system where the government gives tax exemption to somebody and tells him, don't disclose the information to us, not to anyone. So. How can you have a system like this? I think uh, personally, I, as I said, the more openness, the greater transparency that we bring into the electoral process, the better it is for our democracy. With this, we come to the end of this interview. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you.